show that discusses internal and relational anxiety, how it blocks effective leadership, and how we can move through it to a greater health. And now your host, Steve Cuss. And thanks for tuning in. Hey, we all have triggers and relational patterns that can get us stuck. And it's these triggers and stuck patterns that we call anxiety. So anxiety isn't simply worry or fear. It can be any response that keeps us from being fully present to people and to God. And so this podcast is designed to help you name triggers and notice recurring patterns and then give you some tools to break those patterns. And one of the favorite tools we offer on the podcast is a guest. And today's guest is Jim Harrington. And I've asked Jim to come on to talk to us about a very specific tool. It's actually a very personal tool known as a childhood vow. Jim runs The Leader's Journey, and you can actually find Jim at theleadersjourney.us. He and his partner, Tricia Taylor, coach leaders all over the country, inside the church, in organizations. They've written several books. Probably their most famous book is called The Leader's Journey, but they've also written Learning Change, and leading congregational change. Jim, among other things, is a systems theory expert, and I was excited to get him on to talk to us about vows. So I began by simply asking Jim to explain to us, what is a childhood vow? I would say that a vow is a decision that we make pretty early in our lives about how we have to show up in relationships, and particularly with peers and with authority figures, how we have to, how we have to show up in relationships in order to be safe. And so we all have an experience, whether your experience is just a normal childhood experience where, you know, friends make fun of you or they leave you out. Something happens that you get embarrassed and or it can be on the that kind of mild end of the spectrum or it can be on the intense end of the spectrum where uh, you're abused or neglected uh, in some way you're violated. But you have this painful experience. And when that painful experience happens, uh, you you go internal and you ask the question, wow. Why did that happen? What did I do to cause that? And how do I have to show up in these relationships tomorrow in order for that not to happen again? And so then what we do is we begin to experiment with some behaviors um, that, and over time we discover what makes us safe. And then we practice those behaviors and we practice them long enough that they get internalized uh, and they become habits or automatic responses. And so then when something comes up later in life that reminds you of that experience, you feel threatened, you feel like you might get hurt or you might get left out or you might get uh, embarrassed, you might get scared, Uh, like blinking or breathing, your brain takes you back to that uh, pre, you know, that programmed response. Um, And, and the impact of that on adults is that you end up having a, you know, a six year old girl or an eight year old boy running your life. So then obviously this is a value you made when you were a kid, typically. Um, it might be helpful just as we d- dig into this. How is it helpful when you're a child? Like, it sounds like it's actually a useful tool when you're a kid. Right, exactly. That's exactly what we say. You know, uh, uh, you can't go around in childhood just being completely vulnerable all, all the time. And so we say to people all the time, when you make a vow and it works for you, uh, you're a genius uh, because you survived. <laughs> um, and uh, and so that's a good thing. So I grew up in a home where there was a lot of violence. Uh, and my wife, on kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum, grew up in, in a home where it was a really, really loving, safe environment. Uh, but the message she got pretty early on was, you've got to always do things right or love gets withheld. Uh, and so you can see how opposite those are. I mean, in a really loving environment, that happens. In a really unsafe environment, that happens. Both of us made some decisions about what it's like to be safe. And so for me, it was reading the room. Uh, it was being really clear about not having any needs, not drawing attention to myself. For her, it was about be- being a perfectionist, always getting it right, never risking anything that she, she uh, might fail at. Uh, and as adults, you know, we would both say, oh, that, that behavior is not productive. Uh, for being a responsible adult. And when relationships got um, got threatening, we would revert to those behaviors. We wouldn't think about it. That's what makes it so powerful. If I woke up in the morning and said, if I feel threatened today, I think what I'll do is become invisible and not have any needs, or I'll really read the room. If, I, if that was a conscious thought, then I'd have a lot more uh, power over it. 
But the fact that it happens out of the limbic part of our brain, where breathing and blinking and that kind of stuff comes from, it just happens automatically. And so a lot of the work is learning to uh, kind of deconstruct your first formation and begin to, to name uh, the vow that you made. Paul talks about taking off the old self and putting on the new self. And, and what I would say is it's really hard to take off what you can't see and name. This old self is this automatic response that we made uh, before we came to Christ, before we were a, a responsible adult follower. I, I was in a group that you led through the childhood vow experience. I remember, as like I, I was first exposed to childhood vows in my 20s when I was a chaplain, but I wasn't ready. I remember just I couldn't process it. I was 24. When you led it through, I was, I think, uh, maybe 40, 41. And as soon as you laid it out the way you just did now, I knew what my vows were. But I was in a group with a couple of people who didn't. They, they heard you, they believed you, but they were not able to then go back and succinctly name a vow. How would you coach someone to, like, like you said, it's in the limbic brain, how do you make the unconscious conscious? Primary answer to that uh, is in what we call the information practice reflection cycle. And so you get this information about a vow and then you go practice. And what that means is you just go live your life and you start watching to notice uh, where something happens, where you get stopped, where you, where, like the way I would say it is where you you can't be your true self. Maybe you say or do something that, that you wish you hadn't said or done, or you don't say or don't do something that you wish you had not set, said or done. And um, uh, when that happens, for most people that happens and then they get away from it and they say, Oh, I need to reflect on that. I wonder why I got stopped. I wonder why I said or did something or didn't say or didn't do something. And particularly if you can reflect with a peer or a mentor, somebody who's doing this work, a coach, uh, then what will happen over time is the, the unconscious will begin to surface. And it won't happen. Trisha, my partner, Trisha Taylor, uh, calls it learning in the rearview mirror. For, for people who it doesn't become apparent really quickly, uh, it takes some time. And so you you reflect and then you go back and live your life and then you get stopped and then you do some more reflection uh, over time. I've been doing this work for since 2003. I've never, I've had a lot of people say, oh, I don't think I have any vows. <laughs> uh, but I've never had a person who did the work uh, who wasn't able to discover a vow and name it really clearly and precisely. So it's that, in, that information practice reflection as a, as a, a, a way of doing discipleship that I think is what helps you get there. Yeah, we've tried to help people identify their vow by paying attention to the absolutes and superlatives in their self-talk. Could you speak to that? Yeah, so I think what you're saying uh, is what we say is, is that you find your vows when you say, I will always or I will never, this has to be or that can never be, uh, anywhere that there's all or nothing black or white thinking. Uh, that's often uh, uh, an indication that you've had an experience uh, that causes you to think that way, and and often the the roots of the vow are there. And again, and again, it's like it's like with where you get stopped. Once you can see that, then uh, reflecting on that. Now, here, here's a part of the challenge, Steve, is that some people can't find their vows because it requires them to go back to some painful experiences. And and all of us as human, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, "I hope I get to suffer a little bit today." You know, we all are working really diligently. We distract ourselves. We medicate ourselves. We do whatever we have to do to keep from feeling the pain. And so a part of, of what I would say is that if you're going to discover name and, and get set free from a vow, a part of what is just required is that you increase your pain tolerance. You have to grow your capacity to step into some of those painful memories uh, and, and, and then sit with them, be with them. Uh, and help them to uh, um, help them to um, come alive for you. Okay, so you've been doing this work 15, 20 years. Um, there's no way to put a number on it, but you're not you're not suggesting that everyone has one vow. Uh, 
Yeah, well, so we have more than one kind of pattern of suffering. You, you might have an experience with authority figures. You might have a different experience with peers. You might have a different experience with romantic relationships. Um, what I would say is uh, work with whatever comes up and then just be open. Um, uh, sometimes what happen is, happens is you'll get a vow that's like around authority figures. And you don't even recognize that you've got vows around peers or romantic relationships. And then something happens. And because of the practice you've done uh, around authority figures, then you have some skill sets for looking at this thing with peers or with, uh, with um, uh, romantic relationships. I, I think the other thing that I would say about that is that sometimes, like so often in life, what we get in our, when we first start doing the vow work is we get a presenting issue. Like um, early on when I was doing the vow work, <clears throat> I, was, I was pretty sure that any time I got angry, uh, the, uh, I had a lot of, I, I grew up with, around a lot of rage. And as a young adult, I had, I had a lot of rage to be set free from. And early on, I, I recognized that when I got really angry that my vow had been triggered. Um, and I thought that the vow was the, I mean, the, that the anger was the, the, the root to that vow. But actually what I discovered over time was that was a presenting issue. And what was under that was fear. And so when I began to, it's one question to ask, what are you afraid of? It's another question. It's another, it's one question to ask, what are you angry about? It's another question to ask, what are you afraid of? And sometimes what you get when you're working on vows is you get, you get a vow, but it's a symptom of a deeper underlying issue that it just takes a while to get it to be clear. And so both of those ways are ways that I keep digging in. And uh, Tricia, my, my colleague, uh, was in a retreat. I mean, we've been working on this together since 2003. Uh, and we were in a retreat in about 2012 or 13, and she came uh, out of one of the solitude times and says, I've just unearthed a, a new vow that, I have, that I've been blind to. And I mean, she's, you know, she's a therapist. She's smart as a, a whip. She's worked on this stuff. And so I, I think that it's probably uh, an unfolding journey that you're on all of your life. I think it's really helpful for our listeners to hear that anger is a good um, pathway into a fear. I, I know in in what we teach, you know, we we focus a lot of our teaching on anxiety, and I always have people say, "Well, I'm not really a very anxious person," and and we have to educate them on anxiety isn't simply worry. Like if you show up angry, that's an anxious response. That's what you're saying too, I think. Yeah. So uh, in family systems theory, they don't use the language exactly like we use it popularly. <clears throat> they have they would talk about three different internal processes. One of them would be the emotional process, and that would be where you uh, do conflict, distance, over under function, or or projection. And they would say that more often than not, that no feelings are associated with those. That those are instinctive responses that just happen, like blinking or breathing associated with those and following them seven to nine seconds after you've already, your brain has already gotten you into the, uh, whatever the emotion is, uh, you, you feel feelings, which are mad, sad, glad, scared, uh, guilt, and shame. We talk about those as the primary colors of feelings. Obviously there are many more, lots of intensities. There are a thousand words you could use to describe feelings, but, but living systems theory would describe emotions as that, conflict, distance, over, under, function, and projection, they would describe feelings as mad, sad, glad, scared, guilt, and shame. And then they would say you also have thinking processes. And that a part of what makes it really difficult to name, and they don't use the language of taking off the old self, but, but they would say part of what's really hard to get connected to your inner self is that when you first start doing this work, all three of those things are intertwined like a hot bowl of spaghetti. Um, and so some of the initial work is just doing the work of naming those three components. When I'm coaching people, I will say, tell me about the emotion. Are you doing conflict? Are you distancing? Are you over-functioning or under-functioning? Are you projecting? They'll, you know, they'll poke around on that and they'll say what there is to say. And then I'll say, so, what, so if the options are mad, sad, glad, scared, guilt, or shame, what do you think you're feeling? And often it takes a while, depending on how, how articulate they are around their feelings, uh, it takes a while to name that. And then I'll ask the question, so what do you think about that? And uh, the discipline of sorting those three out 
uh, so that they can get to their thinking processes is a really powerful uh, practice uh, when you're all stirred up around around anxiety. Yeah, I, I really appreciate how you're modeling for us the power of coaching and a mentor. Like this, this work really does require dialogue and a safe environment. A really safe place, yeah. Yeah. Um, so earlier, because you just uh, gave us uh, a fairly uh, comprehensive overview of some systems language, Let's uh, pull back a little. You mentioned anger as a presenting problem. Could you let's let's go the other way? What about um, somebody who avoids conflict? Could you help somebody who's an avoider go from noticing that they avoid and and tracking that into the vow? What I just did, I almost always do. When somebody comes and they're they're working on this. I give them the language that I just gave you. I'll give it to them in written form because we have a lot of confuse. I mean, we don't use the, the, the vernacular the way that systems theory uses it. And so it takes people a little while to distinguish emotions from feelings. Uh, and, you know, we, they might talk to me about an experience that they've had. Uh, and, um, uh, and then their homework assignment will be to take a piece of paper and divide it into three columns and on the left-hand column write what the, the emotions are in using systems language and then in the center column write down every feeling that they think might be associated with it and then in the third column they, they write down what they're what they're what they're thinking uh and when they come back uh then uh depending on who the coach is but to answer your question uh if, if they if they came back and and the feeling column was the column where they you know had the most clarity and they had the most uh um uh willingness to work, then I would do two or three things with them. I, I would ask them to, in, in naming that feeling, so let's say they're angry, and then uh, I would ask them to uh, describe how intense that anger is. I use the illustration that if I come home and there's a pot of water boiling over on the stove, that leads me to one action. If I come home and there's a there's flames coming out of the roof of the house, that leads me to another action. So I need to know how intense these feelings are. I ask them to locate these feelings in their body. So much of Western Christianity has separated discipleship from the human body. And Dallas Willard was my mentor who helped so much to reintegrate that stuff. Your body is giving you signals all the time that you're, unless you've got a little training, uh, you ignore it. And so I'll say, so, you know, is your chest burning? You have a knot in the pit of your stomach or your shoulders tightened up or your cheeks flushing? Tell me where you feel this in your body. That becomes important, Steve, because um, if they, particularly if this is the first time they're noticing that, what that means is the anger has been being experienced and gone unrecognized. And uh, there, there's a part of the brain, our brains can't notice everything. So if I've been going along not really noticing the anger, the first time I notice it, then once I notice it, I won't, I won't ever be able to not notice it again. And that's a real step forward. And so I ask them to locate it in their bodies. And then I ask them um, uh, uh, to, to own the feeling. And this is probably the most important piece of the conversation, because often when you're working with a vow, uh, w w without a little bit of coaching, what we do is we begin to look out there and ask the question, who did this to me? You know, who, who hurt me, who embarrassed me, who scared me, who abused me. Uh, and surely somebody else uh, contributed, was involved in the story of the vow. Uh, but the, 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 after they've, they've named the intensity of the vow, I mean, of the, of the feeling, then what I ask them to do is I ask them to own the feeling. And what that means is this feeling belongs to me, though somebody else may have contributed to the circumstances that result in that feeling. This feeling belongs to me. I'm responsible for it. And then I ask the question, what's the impact of just continuing to live in that anger? And that's always a very fruitful conversation because uh, anger scares people. Anger cuts you off from people. Generally, the answer is some version of it reduces intimacy between me and God or between me and other people or even between me and myself. And then finally, what I ask them to do is just to begin to be curious. Um, that I say to them really uh, clearly, I don't think you can change this. I think that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, I think there's some things that only God can do, and there's some things that God won't do unless we do some things. And so uh, frequently they'll say, well, then what, what is it that I'm supposed to do? And I'll say, it's your job to hold this anger in the light. 
with with whatever intensity it's at, with whatever the impact is, that you hold it in the light. You you come to God uh, in, in in a moment, and you just hold that anger up. You say, God, this is here. This is real. This is undermining my relationship to you and to others and to myself. I want this healed. I want to know what the roots of this are. Um, and and that's and and here's the deal. That is painful. That's going to be physiologically painful in your body. It's not going to be excruciating, but it's going to be painful. And when you do that, I believe what happens is, you know, Paul prayed that the Ephesian Christians would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation. I believe that what happens is that by staying in that pain and being curious in the presence of the Lord, that some stuff gets revealed to us uh, that uh, we wouldn't have seen otherwise. Often that's several conversations. Often that's a coach saying, you know, way to go. I know this is hard. Don't give up. Uh, there, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of freedom at the end of this. Um, but, but it's that kind of cycled pattern. And then we're back in the information practice reflection cycle. And so in the coaching session where we're doing that, then they go back after we've talked some, you know, they go back and hold that anger in the presence of the Lord. And, uh, uh, and sometimes it comes quickly and sometimes it's a, a long process, but over time the Lord reveals, uh, what's, what's under that anger and what, uh, uh, what needs to be done for either healing to come or for self-control and self-discipline to be developed. I, I think we're in an era where people are on a self-awareness kick. But what I like about your work is um, you're moving from self-awareness to impact awareness. I guess that's the way I'd say it. And I really like how you you help people see the impact of their vow, in this case, uh, on themselves and on others. Because to me, that is where transformation starts to take place. The other thing you do that I haven't heard you say overtly yet is, um, if, if I recall, you make people specifically write their vow out and repent of it and replace it with truth. Right. Uh, and so uh, when we're doing work around the vow and it gets, they get even a little bit of clarity, uh, then there's a time of prayer where uh, we ask the person to repent. And we, we work real hard to say this is not about you know shame and guilt and wailing and gnashing of teeth. There may be some grief there, but, but really this is about you have a set of habits that have been taking you one way. You've been going down the road going this way. And what we're asking is to, to do the kind of repentance that would say, I'm going to turn and go a different way. I'm going to go the opposite way. And they need a little help sometimes to, to you know, name what that is. Uh, and once they've named it, then uh, we ask them to pray a prayer, a prayer of repentance where they confess that they've been uh, uh, living in that vow and that that is a reflection of not trusting God, of not believing his word, of not, um, you know, of not living in the, in the disciplines. Uh, and we do that in a really shame free way. We, we, by the time we've gotten to that, we work real hard at saying, you know, there's nothing here but learning. There's no shame. And then uh, once they've repented, then we ask them, to describe the behavior that the, the repentance would look like. Like if you've been going this way and you start going this way, describe that behavior to you. Um, and they'll describe that and we'll help them with that. And sometimes that takes several sessions to get crystal clear too. Uh, and then uh, we use, um, there's another piece of our work uh, around integrity where we talk about part of what it means to be fully human is that we're created in God's image. God creates with God's word. And so because we're created with our, in his image, there's something about the use of our giving our word that makes a real difference. And so we ask them to give their word to living into this new vow. Um, I had a, a quick story. I was leading a, a retreat up in Albany, New York, and a woman came to me at the end of the retreat. We've been doing some of this work. And she said, uh, I said, what do you want to repent of? And she said, I rage in my home. I've got three young children and I, I rage in my home multiple times a week. And so we walk through that process 
where she repented, where she said, here's what it would look like for me to go a different direction. And then with some hesitance, because she often, we talk about giving, making a promise to, uh, giving your promise to something that you can't, don't currently have the power to keep. She was a little reluctant because she knew how much power the rage had over her. Um, uh, and so just, uh, you know, I encouraged her to do that. And uh, she did. And so then a year and a half later, she's in a small group online with me in some of our work. And I'm talking about the power of giving your word. Uh, and she, and, and here's the testimony she gave. She told the story that I just told you of coming to, to the, the prayer time at the retreat. And she said, I have been prayed over a hundred times and maybe 500 times about raging in my home. And, and, I, and nothing has changed. But she said, in that moment at that retreat, when Jim asked me to give my word, there was something about giving my word that shifted something. And she said, it was 18 months ago that I was in that retreat, and I've raged in my home five times in 18 months. Uh, and so, and that was an unsolicited testimony from her. Um, and so th- we think there's something real powerful about giving your word to, to God, to yourself, uh, to one or two other people that are really trustworthy in your life. Um, and then doing the work over time to, to develop the new habits that reflect the new vow. Yeah. What I find profound about that is, is it, it, what I hear you saying is you're displacing a vow with a vow. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot of brain science out there that says that somewhere between 40 and 60% of all behavior of any human being is uh, habitual. We don't think about it. If you want to read a great secular book, uh, it's called The Power of Habit, Why We Do What We Do in Life and in Business. Uh, uh, and we were onto that before I read that book. But what we began to recognize was that there were these deeply held habits around that grab your vow and those were nobody nobody changes deeply held habits you know by getting some fairy dust from god that magically uh you know takes those away and gives you a new set of habits and so the the positive vow is also a set of habits (laughs) uh but they're a set of habits that reflect the teaching of the word that reflect our understanding of god that reflect uh, our uh, what it looks like to follow jesus and with practice over time then there's a positive vow that under pressure is what you'll revert to. Uh, I really like that. Yeah. W- w- the way we say it is, you know, one more prayer isn't going to do it. <laughs> and that, that was this lady's experience. She, she needed a different spiritual tool. Yeah. Okay. I've got two final questions on vows. Um, what's your opinion on uh, the human development scale and a vow? Is a vow made earlier in life more deeply entrenched than a vow made later in life? Uh, yes, I think so, unless the vow made later in life uh, is connected to some kind of traumatic experience. Uh, if they have a traumatic experience, then it, 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 the research seems to say that that almost overrides everything that existed before. Okay, so it's fair to say then that uh, uh, the deepest entrenched vows would either be when you were youngest or when you were in the most pain or needing the most protection. Right, exactly. Okay. I think that's helpful because I, I, I've I uncovered some vows I made when I was four or five, six years old, mm-hmm. but I was surprised to uncover a vow that I made when I was 17. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that caught me off guard that I was still making these agreements with myself that late in life yeah. on yeah. how to avoid pain. And yeah, yeah. Well, what, I, what I say to people is don't worry too much about where they were formed. Uh, if some, you know, if in the presence of God's a memory comes up or a thought comes up, I, I encourage people to trust that, uh, and to follow it until it's not fruitful to follow it anymore. It's, for me, it's much more about the power of the work being done than it is. Was this in early childhood or in adolescence or in young adulthood? And I'd just like to testify as well, having gone through the experience that you've led through, um, there was tremendous power for me in writing it out because when it was externalized, it was absurd. That's like, I think that's part of what you said too, is, is I was carrying this lie that I believed. I didn't know it, but as soon as I wrote it out, I saw it and said, that's not, that's not true. And that made repentance both easier and more freeing and less shameful. Uh, and then in my own life, uh, walking by faith now has more to do with believing what God says more than I believe what I think. 
Jim, I think it would be really helpful if you would be willing to share one vow from your own life as concretely and just lead us through what's the vow, how did you uncover it, and what's the truth that displaced it? Yeah, uh, so uh, I grew up in the home of two um, remarkable, amazing human beings. Uh, my dad was a uh, high school football coach, principal, uh, superintendent of schools uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. He was the white guy who led the civil rights movement in our little northeast Louisiana farming community. And what was also true was that uh, he had grown up in a home. He had been raised by his grandmother. His parents were alcoholics, and uh, his grandmother, who raised him, was shot and killed in the living room of their house in his presence when he was 14 years old. And so he came to adult life with a lot of unresolved, unaddressed trauma. And there were a, a half a dozen, maybe a dozen times over my growing up years where uh, his anger got out of control and he became violent with me. Uh, the good news is that he lived long enough that uh, all of that got redeemed and uh, we became really good friends as, when we were adults. But what I learned pretty early on, uh, I, I have actually several vows that are associated with my relationship to my dad. Uh, the probably the, the most um, um, the, the most the, the most easy to identify the one that I identified first uh, was that I learned to read a room uh, uh, you, you could tell when dad was angry and and I would walk in the house looking for him and noticing every little detail about his demeanor about his facial expressions about his body language about his tone the voice everything about that um, and, uh, and what I learned, the, 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 um, the behavior that I learned to engage was to be still, to be invisible, uh, to not need anything, to not ask for anything, to not want anything. Um, and so, uh, that was the experience that I had. The, the meaning that I made, uh, was that adult authority figures weren't safe and that there was something unworthy of love for me that the, uh, the guy who was supposed to love me the most in life hit me like that. As I as I began to work through that vow, um, I'm, I'm, I'm now 27 years old in this story. I've just joined the staff of the Western Hills Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas, and I've been there about three months, and the senior pastor, Preston Bright, says to me, what's going on between you and Bob? And I said, uh, nothing that I know of. Why? And he said, well, I've just noticed that uh, anytime anybody from the church comes in a room, you, you move toward them. You're very gregarious. You're engaging. Uh, you, uh, you remember their names. You remember things they've told you. You ask about, you know, their family and their work. But when Bob walks in the room, you stand still. And if he moves towards you very rapidly, you actually back up. Really? <laughs> really? I am completely oblivious to that behavior. Uh, what Preston did, Preston was an amazing pastor. He was one of the first guys who gave me some language for being able to talk about some of this. What he did was over a several month period of time, helped me to realize that Bob looked like, acted like, sounded like my dad. He was six two, like my dad was. He was bald in the center of his head. Like my dad was, he was an introvert. Like my dad was, was your brain can't distinguish chronic anxiety from, um, from acute anxiety. And as he was walking toward me, my brain was going alert, alert, danger, danger. And what I was doing was what I had learned to do. I had made a vow of being still, being invisible, reading the room. Uh, the positive vow that I made as I began to, um, to, to uncover that was that I was going to be authentic and vulnerable, appropriately vulnerable with, a, with the authority figures in my life. Now, you can imagine, given the intensity of the trauma that I'd experienced, I didn't make that positive vow and then wake up the next day and, and when Bob walked into the room, you know, just go running toward him and hugging his neck and, and uh, uh, being all, all gregarious. Uh, what I can look back and see is that early on, all I could do when he walked in the room was I, I became alert to that behavior. And then over time with some coaching, I learned uh, to stand still when he moved toward me. And then with some, uh, with some practice over time, what I learned to do is to move toward him. Uh, and that became a practice session for me where ultimately I, I told him my story. I became really vulnerable about, um, about how his, how 
him showing up in the room impacted me. Uh, and it was, it was that initial relationship with him that became the practice field then for other authority figures in my life, where rather than being silent, invisible, quiet, reading the room, that I showed up. I was vulnerable and authentic. I said what there was for me to say. I'm 66 years old. Uh, that story with Bob Jones happened when I was 27 years old. And there are still an occasional moment uh, where um, that stuff gets triggered for me. I think the, uh, here's what I believe, Steve. I believe that the power of a negative vow never goes away. Uh, that that wounding is kind of like, you know, walking with a limp. Um, but what happens is you recognize them sooner. You have tools that you get, get you untriggered and more quickly you can move back to your true self. Um, and that's been my experience with the, with the vow that I had related to my dad. I think, um, I think you just gave us a real gift there, Jim. And I, I just want to pull out three or four things that I heard. Um, one of the things I love is you you were very careful to honor your parents and honor your dad. And I think there can be a misunderstanding in this kind of material that this, what you're doing, this work you do with people, it's not really very interested in blame. And so I appreciate how you, you framed your parents and then also were able to fully own your pain. I think that's a key point for our listeners as they do this work. Let me, let me interrupt you. Around your, your parents, a lot of people struggle to do this work because the honor of your mother and father is so deeply rooted in them that somehow this feels dishonoring. And what I, what I say to them is you can honor your parents and tell the truth about the impact of their behavior. It's not either or. It can be a both and. And sometimes that's hard for people to overcome. Well, and even in the narrative you gave, you you had great empathy for your father's own upbringing. You made sure we understood what he was carrying and how it impacted you. Uh, the other thing I want to make sure our listeners don't move past is um, the decades of work and the the gradual that you, you were very gracious to yourself to take baby steps. Um, the other thing that you pointed out is, and I think this is essential to healing, is at some point in your journey, you had the incredible courage to then be vulnerable to the very person you're intimidated by. And I, boy, I think that's huge. I, I, I want to be very careful to say, I think it's huge too. And if being vulnerable to someone who has traumatized you, if they've beaten you, they've raped you, they, you know, left you for days at a time, uncared for as a child. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of power in that work, and I think you need a really seasoned coach. Um, I, 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 had a, I don't know if you have time for another story, but I, I had a woman in the church that I was pastoring uh, before I went to the faith walking work who uh, at about 40 years of age, her dad be, uh, developed leukemia. Uh, and she came to me and we'd been doing some, some of this work. And she came to me and said, I've got to go see my dad and forgive him. And I knew her story. He had raped her several times when she was a, a teenage girl. And, I, I, you know, this is crazy, Steve, but I said to her, oh, I called her name. I said, you don't have to do that. You, you, you get a pass. What your dad did to you was beyond anything that is, uh, is imaginable. And, and she said, no, I don't. She said, I, I, I don't want him to die and me carry the burden of this around. Uh, I want to forgive him. I, I want to be free. And I said, okay. I said, uh, you know, I just want to be real clear. I'm not asking you to do this. This is something you've decided to do. And so uh, her dad lived in another city in Texas, and uh, she made plans to go visit him. He was in the hospital. Uh, she went to this city. And uh, when, she, when she came home, I asked how it went. She said, I got there, but I couldn't go to the hospital. Really, you don't have to do this. No, I'm going to do this. She said, I'm going back. She went back a second time and she went to the hospital, but she couldn't go into his room. She went back a third time. She went into his room, but she couldn't say anything. She had seven visits before she was able to say to her dad what she wanted to say. And, and that was over about a six month period of time while he was dying of leukemia. And there were multiple coaching calls involved in all of that. And today that's been 15 years ago. She is one of the finest uh, w women that I know. And, 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 uh, demonstrates amazing freedom from all 
the trauma that she experienced. So I'm just saying you have to be really careful because the trauma work is incredibly hard and it takes time. It needs a good coach. It has to go slow. Um, uh, and I think there's real freedom there. Yeah. I really appreciate you making sure we understand the context because when you went to the leader in the church, he had not traumatized you. Exactly. Um, exactly. He's what, in, in my material, we call it same species syndromes. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's different, but going, going to the person that actually traumatized you may in fact be the very wrong thing to do, or in the story you just shared with appropriate safety, maybe very healing, right. but it's case by case. Yeah. The, the, the systems theory says, uh, what'd you call it? An appropriate uh, or a similar species? Yeah, same species syndrome. Yeah. If somebody yeah. who's a specific species hurt you, then all of that species is, is a right. suspect. Exactly. exactly. The theory says that you'll make progress by doing work with that species. The theory says that if you want the most progress, a little bit of work with your family of origin is more powerful than a lot of work with the same species. Mm. Yeah. And so if it's possible, you know, particularly if, if, if it's not a, a, a traumatic experience, if it's possible to do some work with your mom, your dad, your siblings, uh, that's, uh, that's where you make the most progress. Well, and we're definitely getting into a pretty nuanced area, probably beyond the scope of a podcast, but it also makes me think of um, Brene Brown does, I think, some very helpful coaching on there is a way to be vulnerable with somebody without them being able to damage you. Like you can... You can seek forgiveness or seek to forgive without your heart being fully in their hands. And I think you're also inferring that. I am. Uh, I, I am. I, I love uh, what she says uh, about telling your story to someone who's uh, worthy of hearing it. Uh, and what I believe is that uh, this, the work we're talking about, one helpful way to think about that is to think about it as a skill set that you're developing. And I mean, we talk so much about uh, how uh, following Jesus is not just about believing the right things, but that there's a set of practices that we want to master. And so uh, I start by practicing with the low hanging fruit, you know, and then I grow that skill over time. Uh, and, uh, and over time, you know, what Jesus calls us to is enemy love. I mean, that's the, the kind of the consummate picture that he calls us to. And, um, and so what, what does it take to grow your capacity to get, forgive until you're so skilled at that that you can forgive even an enemy? I, I, and to think of it as a skill set rather than as something that I can do or can't do uh, helps people think developmentally. I love that. And, and, you know, you mentioned Jesus' command to love our enemy um, a friend of mine, Carl Wheeler, he says, the reason it's a command is because none of us want to do it, first of all. But I think you're also encouraging us to consider that it's good for us. Like uh, we're the ones that are freed, right? And that's probably hasn't been covered as well in th thousands of sermons. Exactly. I, I have, I mean, we've done, I've done this work long enough and I'm sure you have too, uh, that, that I could tell you story. We could spend the whole podcast just telling stories of people who are in bondage to fear and anger and uh, uh, greed, all, all kinds of things, uh, who have become, who've been set free, and and who I, I'm not the one who's saying that they're free. Their wife or their husband or their children or their parents are coming to us and saying, "I want some of whatever it is that he or she is getting because they're they're just so much different than they used to be." So one of the ways we try to help our listeners is just help them in the baby steps of identifying anxiety. You've already referred to it physiologically. Uh, how do you know when you're anxious physiologically? Uh, for me, uh, my, I, either my chest burns or I get a knot in this burning sensation in the pit of my stomach. When, when you get that, what's your next step? Uh, when it's possible, what I do is I, I try to pause and take some deep breaths. Uh, there's a lot of research that says that turns the volume down on the anxiety. And I've, you might see me in a meeting over there really breathing deeply. And, and what you would know is uh, I have uh, 
I've had my anxiety triggered. The other thing that if I can get to the deep breathing, then the other thing that I do is I open up on my phone, I open up my guiding principles. So on my phone, I've got a, a notes thing. And uh, what anxiety does is it stirs up your feeling processes and simultaneously it shuts down your thinking processes. And so if I can get to my guiding principles and begin to read them, well, just reading them gets me to my thinking processes. And then the, the other thing that it does is it gets me to begin thinking. And so one of my guiding principles, is I want to be courageous. Well, if I were being courageous in this moment, what would I be doing? It gets me to some behavior. And just all of that thinking uh, helps calm the feeling processes and gets me focused on the positive values, the, the, the guiding principles, the values that I want to be living in. You know, what I really love about what you shared, Jim, is you've already told us you're 66 years of age. You've been doing this work almost 40 years. And I have found people who do this work, they get embarrassed by still needing to do these tools. And we, we try to tell people all the time, this is a lifelong thing. So I love that four decades in. I believe that. I believe that. I believe that part of the, the, what's uh, broken in the Western church is that we've made discipleship about believing the right things and having a few practices rather than there being some stuff to master that takes a lifetime. Yeah, or it's, or it's one and done. People, people feel like, oh, we should, I should have had this figured out by now. One of the theories on our podcast is that leadership is vulnerability. Is, uh, and when you make a mistake, you're always making a mistake publicly. And therefore, leaders over time, if they don't do this work, they start going into um, risk management rather than faith walking. Would you be willing to share a recent mistake you made and what you had to do to recover from it? Yeah. Um, uh, just recently, I was uh, so I work with a team of pastors from across the country in a group called Churches Learning Change. They're all smaller membership churches that are in decline, and they're trying to, you know, find a way to uh, transform the pastor and the the local congregation. And we have a we're we're in we're in places all across the country and in Canada. Uh, we have eight regions, and every summer we come together for learning community. Uh, and uh, I'm the, uh, Trisha Taylor, and I are the leaders of the community. And recently we were together. There were like 40 people in the room. And one of the young guys in our in our group is a fuller PhD student uh, who is I, I love dearly. I, I we're friends. I've been his mentor. And so, in lots of ways, he's been mine. Uh, and he was making a presentation uh, and something about the way that he was presenting and what he was saying, my vows got triggered uh, and I disrupted the entire hour long process. I called him out. Uh, I, I argued with him in front of, I embarrassed him in front of his peers. Uh, I disrupted the agenda for the day. Uh, <laughs> It was like, later, it was like, holy moly, Harrington, what happened to you? Uh, but, and, and what I, here's what I did. I did the practice that we teach people. Uh, with, within a couple of hours, I was with him one-on-one, -on -one, apologizing, getting present to the impact, figuring out what, you know, try, trying to figure out what had happened with me. I had a cut. Trisha was there, had a conversation with her where she was helping me do some uh, reflection. And then uh, I, I kind of got clear about what had happened, about how my vows had been triggered. And then I uh, uh, wrote an email to all 36 or 37, 38 people who had been in the meeting and owned what I did and asked them for the impact. Uh, what we teach is that when you make a mistake, that what you need to do is own your mistake, ask for what the impact is, and then offer an apology. And, uh, and boy, the, the impact stung. You know, I mean, I knew it would because I knew that what I had done was really inappropriate and, and unaffected. Uh, but over about a month-long period of time, cleaned up that mess. Uh, got a lot of appreciation for being vulnerable and for modeling, you know, what I... Um, what, what I taught people. And there were some people in the room who were really wounded by what I did because they have vows around authority figures and I'm the authority figure in the room who's acting badly. Uh, ultimately it all got worked out, but it was really painful and a really good learning experience for me. Give us one time where you've seen anxiety be contagious in a group. Oh, in that story that I just told you, <laughs> uh, 
And that story that I just told you, what happened was, as I began to disrupt the process, there were about six other people uh, who got anxious and began to do the same thing. And I didn't realize this until I was debriefing with Tricia later, but there were two people who got up and walked out of the room. Rather than doing conflict, what they were doing was distancing. Uh, it was just, you know, it was like the whole room got electrified uh, with my anxiety, and it was just crystal clear. Uh, when in your life do you feel most fully loved? Uh, well, I'm married to a remarkable human being who, uh, is empathic and, uh, who, um, understanding and who really loves me. And when I have really messed up, I feel really loved when I can come home and tell her that story and with no judgment, with no condemnation, with no anything, but, uh, understanding and empathy. Um, I feel profoundly loved. I, I feel profoundly loved when I um, uh, when I'm when I'm in a coaching relationship, uh, and in the mutual vulnerability that goes with the, our storytelling, uh, and and somebody begins to get set free. It's like, man, I was made for this. Ugh, this just I feel so alive in in those moments. I think those would be the two things that come to mind. Okay, last question, Jim. Uh, give us an activity or a place, like an actual geographical location. So an activity or a location that makes you feel most fully alive. Uh, anywhere that I can. So if you want a specific place uh, in, in North Carolina, there's a, a cabin up in the mountains that we have access to, have had access to along the way. Uh, and I grew up on a farm in Northeast Louisiana. And though I live in a city, I love the city that I live in. Uh, when I can get out in the woods, up in the mountains, uh, particularly when it's cool in the mornings and not terribly hot in the afternoon, uh, there's something about that that makes me feel really connected to the earth and connected to God. It's mm, really powerful good. for me. All right. So for our listeners, uh, there's a contingent of our listeners who've known about Jim Harrington for a while. For I would guess for many of you, this is your first exposure to him. And you're figuring out as you listen why he's such a gold mine. So Jim does have a coaching organization that coaches leaders of all stripes, actually humans of all stripes, not just church, but organizational leadership. And so I'll have a link on the website in the show notes to how to get in contact with Jim. Thanks for joining us today. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram from the handle Steve Cusswords. You can also go to stevecusswords.com for more resources. This episode has been a production of Brendan Reed and Steve Cuss.